Paul would preach all night. If you remember that one part in Acts, the little boy fell out the bat, fell out, fell asleep and fell out of the window. He went out there and rose him from the dead. That's the power of God. We're not in time when we're in the power of God. We're in the Spirit. We're in His presence. And that's, that's kind of leading to what I want to talk about today. And I know it had to be said because today is my favorite day of the year. It's one of the top three days of the year. You got Christmas for Jesus' birth. You got resurrection for Him raising from the dead. And uh, probably half you don't even know what today is. Today is Pentecost. My favorite day. You want to know why it's my favorite day? Because the power of God came in me. It came in me. And this is the day. And that's what they're going to be celebrating next Friday down in Buffalo, Pentecost. But today is the real day of Pentecost. Today is the day the Holy Spirit ascended into those men. And Pentecost means 50, 50 days after Jesus rose from the dead. Today is a big day. It's a celebration day. But some of you don't even know that because, you know what? How much do we know God? How much do we know God? Would the Holy Spirit not be evident in you to tell you that this is the day? Ah, oh, praise God. I've been really mourning my heart in the last couple of days. And it's not for me, because I got zeal and I praise God. It's for others. It's for others because others are so caught up in other things they don't even see what's true right in front of their face. And it's not in the natural realm, it's in the spirit realm. Today is Pentecost, and what I, get, what I call this, this sermon, whatever you want to call it, is he real to you? And I say he because Holy Spirit is a person. He's the third person of the Trinity. You've got God, Jesus, and Holy Spirit. A lot of people say the Holy Spirit. Well, it should, and even the Bible does say that, but it should be Holy Spirit, just like you say any other name. Holy Spirit. God is omnipresent. I mean, he is so big, we can't even imagine how big he is. So in saying that, and how big God is, he brought down Jesus onto this planet to show him through a man on what he is. And then he said he was going to ascend so that he could descend the Holy Spirit into each and every one of us. The Holy Spirit is omnipresent. Trust me, if the Holy Spirit, if this day didn't happen, Pentecost, this world would be crazy. If we didn't have the Holy Spirit, we'd be killing each other just to take the food out of your pocket. Just like it was in the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit wasn't evident. Babies were being murdered. Everything was taking place in the Old Testament. You look at the Old Testament, and that's why, because there was no Holy Spirit omnipresent on the planet to keep things semi-normal. So today is a big day. It's a very special day. The Holy Ghost has come in. The power of God has come into us. I want to go into Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. We used to celebrate this in Canada. We used to, we used to have what they call Pentecost Eve, which I think is we're going to have to start doing that here because we have, we have what we need to do that. Pentecost Eve, and believe it or not, was mostly Catholics that were inviting us. And they were in Welland, and they had an open area, and they had a campfire, and they would have a Pentecost Eve celebration, and they would invite all kinds of denominations, Catholic priests, pastors, ministers, lay people would come, gather, eat, and celebrate, have fun, and then worship God for like three, four hours, and then pray with each other. And the power of God was evident, because everybody was there in one accord, not caring about who they were or what they were. And the freedom of God was evident with the Spirit of the Lord. Pentecost Eve celebration. Acts, ver Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. I'm going to go as fast as I can. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, that you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord... Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But 
you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. See, they're still seeing it from a flesh perspective. You're going to come and set the kingdom up here in Israel so that we can get rid of the Romans? Basically, that's what they're saying. That's what they're look, how they're looking at it. And Jesus said, you don't know the times or the seasons. Don't be concerned about that. What you're going to know is that the Holy Spirit's going to come and he's going to give you power. 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 So that you can be witnesses. Witnesses. But Listen. You can't begin your mission until you've received the promise. This is the key to a lot of Christians out there that are flying all over the place. That my heart is just beats for them because I, you know, you cannot begin the mission. The mission is you're a witness, right? Your mission is to be a witness. Jesus said you're going to be a witness to me, right? So you can't begin that mission, that witness, until you have received the power, which is the promise. The promise is the power. power. And in that word power, and some of you have heard it, some of you haven't, but it's a Greek word, dunamis. Dunamis. D-U-N-A-M-I-S. Dunamis, power. And it means a force. A force to produce an effect. A force to produce an effect. So when Jesus says, stay there, you can't do a mission without the promise. You can't do the mission. You can't do, you be a witness without the power. You stay there, be patient, and wait. And wait. A word we don't like to hear. And wait. Till that dunamis power comes upon you, that force that produces an effect that truly changes you. Not just the surface, but into the heart and into the guts, all the way through to your spirit. Truly changes you. Dunamis power. Jesus says in Matthew eleven twelve, 12, which is my verse for the year, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. The violent take it by force. The dunamis power. The violence, the word violence here parallels the word zeal. Zeal. Not we look at it as fist fighting, violence, killing each other. No, this, this word violent means a zeal. So violent of a zeal that you're not going to let anything get in your way because you have the power of God to do the things that you need to do in your life. To change you. To change you. Zeal itself means in an enthusiasm determined to do something. An enthusiasm determined to do something. Take it by force. Take it by force. Can you do that on your own? No, you can't. The disciples knew they couldn't do anything. They knew they couldn't do anything. That determination, that zeal, that determination requires three things. Three things that determination requires. In any particular order, but I'm going to give them this way. The first thing is obedience. It requires obedience. The second thing is discipline. It requires a discipline. And the third thing is humility. Obedience, discipline, and humility. These things have to take place in order for us to see that power of God become evident in us so that it can change us in those things that are around us. God is not a respecter of persons. Remember that. He's not a respecter of anyone. Anybody in this room, we're all matched out right here. 
The only difference, what happens is, who's seeking God more? And it's a race. You can call whatever you want. It's an addiction. Call whatever you want. But I'm seeking God, so I want to be here. I'll leave you here, you're there. Who cares? I, I'm seeking God. Are you seeking God? Are you truly seeking God? Or is it a byproduct of other things you want in your life? That's why when I sat there and watched her do that, just give up Canada and say what she said for America, it's like, she gave it up. Uh, she gave everything up for God. Not for me or anyone else, but for God, because she knows God wants her here the same way he wants me here. Can you do that? I'm not saying it out of the way. I've, it's been 15 years, we're giving it all to the Lord. I'm giving it all to the Lord. Every day I give it to him. There's nothing I own, nothing that's mine. Obedience, discipline, and humility are necessary. Necessary. And you can't get that from flesh, from me. It only comes from what God has given us, that gift of the Holy Spirit. If I was acting out in my own flesh, this, none of this would be taking place. It's the Holy Spirit in me that guides me so that now I can stand here and help teach you guys to do the same thing. Only through the Holy Spirit can we get into that place. So in saying that, in this day that we're celebrating, Jesus tells them to wait. To wait. Obedience, discipline, humility. It takes time to wait. I mean, the Romans are looking for him to kill them all. Anyone has anything to do with Jesus, they want to wipe him out. They want to just end this whole thing. Get it over with. Put it behind us. Let's back up to... Chat, or go up to chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each one of them, each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them other utterance. This is what we're celebrating. Obedience, discipline, humility had to take place for them to wait and then go to that upper room to be in that place. And no, the Bible doesn't say how long they were there in prayer. They could have been there for days, weeks. In prayer, waiting for God, in prayer. But through obedience and discipline and humility, it brought them into the place they needed to be so that the power of the Holy Spirit descended onto them and to all that receive it. That receive it. Now I want you to see something here. When Jesus died on the cross, on Good Friday, they scattered. They scattered. They knew that he's gonna, you know, something's that they're gonna get killed, so they ran away. Jesus is dead. It's all gone. Oh, it's all been fun, but the, this is over. The ministry's over. He's dead. I'm going back to fish. I'm going back to be the tax collector. I'm going back to be whatever they were. They just scattered and went and did their own own thing. They scattered. They were scared. Just like we're scattered. And we're scared without Christ. If I don't have Jesus in my life, and it's been a long time, but before I did, I can remember how I felt. There was always fear in me, anxiety, lashing out with anger, getting high, doing whatever I had to do to try to get rid of that, whatever it was in me that was not good. Scattering, constantly scattering, constantly scattering. Then he rises from the dead. Three days later, he rose from the dead. So in that, they rose from the dead. They saw him. They believed. They believed. They believed because they seen. And Jesus said to Thomas, you know what? Blessed are those that believe that haven't seen, and that's you and me. So we come to Christ. We believe, 
Right? You believe. Oh, yeah, I've saved. I come to the Lord. I'm saved. But it doesn't end there, and a lot of people think it does. It does not end there. Jesus himself said you must be baptized in water and in the Holy Ghost. Both have to take place in our life in order for that true change and true power to take place so that we can live this life without those struggles. And even if there are struggles, uh, praise God. Because I have that peace that only the Holy Spirit can give me inside. So I can look at a man when I was in Canada and he's in jail and he's asking me my opinion on what, should I tell the police everything I did because he came to the Lord while he was in jail. I said, yeah. No, I didn't I take that back. I said, you do what God's telling you to do. Because all he was in there for was just a petty crime. But they wanted him for some home evasions, for all kinds of serious stuff. And they knew he did it, but he kept mocking them and running from them and even calling them and laughing at them and everything else. And they knew, but they just couldn't nail him. God nailed him in jail. And I'm talking to this man. And he's asking me what he should do. And I, I said, I'm just a man. You've got to go to God and ask him. I'm not going to tell you what to do. I saw him a week later. He comes in to see me one-on-one. -on -one. He's smiling. He said, I told him. I said, praise God. How do you feel? He goes, I feel great. I have peace inside. So what happened? He goes, I got 25 years. <laughs> and he was still smiling. That changed my life. It's like, wow, that's the power of God. The Holy Spirit filled him and changed him to sit there and smile. I got 25 years, but I feel good inside. Because I couldn't hold it in anymore. Now that I came to the Lord and I believed, and when the Holy Spirit came upon me, the power of God won't let you live in that stuff anymore. Unless you don't have the power of God in you, you can still live in that stuff. I came over and told Victoria that one. I was like, wow. Every, you know, all the different experiences in jail and how God worked with different men. There's a reason for it. Isaiah, Isaiah 5.13 says, Therefore my people go into captivity for lack of knowledge. Because, why? They have no knowledge. Their honorable men are famished, and the multitude dried up with thirst. You see, that's what's happening here. You see, when the disciples... I didn't finish that with the disciples. I gotta, I gotta go back to that. The disciples scattered like we scatter. They believe because they saw. We believe when we haven't seen because we believe in God. And in that belief, what happens is we get baptized in the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost, when the Holy Ghost came upon them in Pentecost, that changed everything. Even when they first believed, it wasn't that point where they were speaking it without any fear. When the Holy Ghost hit them, everything changed. Everything changed. Eleven out of twelve of them men died for Christ. They didn't die for thievery. They didn't die for anything else. They died for Christ and they spoke it and died for it. And John was kept alive. If you read Josephus and someone that doesn't speak it in the Bible, some of the things they tried to do to kill him, they couldn't kill John because God would not let him die because he had to write the book of Revelations. So they finally couldn't kill him. They put him on the island of Patmos, and that's where he wrote the book of Revelations. And then he died as an old man, only because God wanted this, not because man wanted to do something. God's going to change that and put it upside down if we're truly filled with the Holy Ghost and we're doing what he wants us to do in obedience, discipline, and humility. So these men went from scattered, running scared and not knowing what to do, to believing in Christ, just like us. We run scared, we're scattered until we accept Jesus into our heart and meet it in our heart. Now we're in that first step. We get baptism in water and we come out and we're all one. You know, we, we come out and knowing that we believe in Jesus Christ. But still, in a lot of people, the power's not evident because they haven't been baptized in the Holy Ghost. I was privileged enough and honored enough to be delivered, baptized in, in the Holy Ghost, praying in tongues on the first day that I believed. I got baptized in water months later. And I saw these big Christians coming to me. 
You know, that was out of order. You should have been baptized in water first. And I said, really? I, well, I don't know. I haven't studied the Bible enough, but now I know because I study the Bible. Now, there's plenty of times where people are baptized in the Holy Ghost first and then in water. Water is an outward commitment to what you've already believed in. Holy Ghost is power. So if God wants you to give you the power first, praise God. Go get baptized later. Because the Holy Spirit's going to tell you to. <laughs> so this happened in the transition for the disciples just like it happens to us as a Christian. And that's why a lot of us miss the point. We miss the mark because we've never stepped over the line. We never crossed from believing to being baptized in the Holy Ghost with the power, with the dunamis power, so that we could truly be a witness. Truly be a witness. You're not a true witness if you're talking it and then turn around doing other things. There's no power there. There's no power. So what happens is what? We go into captivity. If we go to the place of being believing and not taking that next step and being filled with the Holy Ghost and the power of God, we go into captivity. It's not that we don't believe, because we do. Therefore, Jesus, God says, therefore, my people. So they're, you're, you're his people. You believe. You're a believer. You're at that point of believing. But he says, my people go into captivity. Because of the lack of knowledge. The lack of knowledge of what? Of knowing. Of knowing what? Knowing that the epignosis, the super knowledge that Peter talks about, the power of God is not evident in you yet because it's not showing that change. It's not showing you being humility and obedience and discipline. Oh, but we use the excuse we all sin, we all fall, sin and fall short of the glory of God. Yeah, we do. But that's what keeps us in humility, not in that sin. Do you understand? That's the scripture. To know that we can sin, and we need to be humble enough to know that we can do it any time, and all we, we got to hang on to Jesus so we don't. So we don't. But God doesn't want us to do that, and you said that as an excuse that it's okay to do it. So when that takes place, the honorable men become famished. So what has happened? What has happened in this society? One day you can be Joe, the next day you can be Jane. You can change your preference of sex any day you want. Is that okay? Yeah, it's okay in society, but not with God. And that's what puts us in captivity. We start touching and agreeing with that to the point where we compromise. We can start compromising. And we start compromising, we loosen up our righteousness. We loosen up our holiness and we invite things to come in. And when those things start to come in, it becomes more and more evident that we compromise. And sometimes, like I said, we don't even know it until someone finally brings it to our attention. Man, what are you doing? What do you mean what I'm doing? I'm doing okay. I'm going to church. I'm doing this. I'm praying to God. I believe. Yeah, well, is the power of God hitting you on the back of the head saying, don't do that no more? Uh, no. Well, because he probably lifted himself up because you've been doing these things. So repent and get back to focusing on God. Because when the men famish, the multitude dry up. And that's what's happening. Like Hosea 4, 6 says, you know what happens? Our kids take on what we've done. And I've repented for me because I was a mess. And my kids were going to be a mess because I let that happen. But when I came to the Lord, I put a brakes on it and stopped it right there and then. And since then, I can see changes starting to take place. In God's time, not mine. But I have complete peace in the power of God of the Holy Spirit in me knowing those things are going to take place. Because I repented. Therefore, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from the wicked ways, I'll hear from heaven. What else? Forgive them and heal the land. Forgiveness comes and the land will get healed if we repent. And we have to repent because we're doing things we shouldn't be doing. And then repentance means true turning to God and clinging to the power of the Holy Spirit that dwells in us. Because as soon as true repentance, here's the Holy Spirit when you're living in the things you shouldn't be doing. But as soon as you print, repent, here comes the Holy Spirit. He's back. And you know it. You can feel it. The power of God's evident. Praise God. It's great to worship him, to have that peace. And he's there. But he's like a dove. And the Bible calls it a dove. It's very docile. When you start moving in the wrong things, poof, flies away. Moves away from you. But God is a loving God. He forgives us 70 times 7 times 7 times 7 times 7. 
So when we ask for that true repentance, here he comes, Holy Spirit. But if you don't have that power of the Holy Spirit, if you haven't baptized in the Holy Ghost, if you don't have that power of the Holy Spirit, you haven't got to that place yet. You haven't got to where the disciples got in Pentecost on that day where the Holy Spirit came upon them. Everything changes. They're not the same anymore. They walk out of there, people think they're drunk. Because they're drunk in the Spirit. People are laughing. And they're not walking around like, oh, hope the Roman soldier doesn't see me. No, they're laughing, they're walking around, they're praising God. And they're going around with the power of God because they know that the power of God is evident in them and around them and will protect them. It changed everything. It changed everything. 2 Corinthians 13, 4 and 5. The word is so important. Don't underestimate the word of God, but so is the power of God. Too much word, you're going to dry up. Too much spirit, you're not going to blow up. Just enough word and just enough spirit, you grow up. You mature into what God wants you to be with a balance in your life, with the power of God in you. That's what we're seeking. 2 Corinthians 13, 4 and 5. Paul says, For though he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. Jesus lives in God. Jesus lived in God. He lives with God and lives in God. And he's saying that Jesus, God lives in us through Jesus. The Holy Spirit is what lets us know that. And it's the power of Holy Spirit that gives us the evidence of that. The evidence of it. And how we don't have to adhere to other people. Because they do it, I got to do it. Yeah. No, if it's against what God tells you to do, the Holy Spirit's there to give you the power to back away from it. To back away from it. There is no excuse. Paul tells us in Corinthians that God will always give you, if the Holy Spirit's in you, God will always give you a way out. It's your choice whether you want to take it or not. Amen. There isn't any time that anyone has made the wrong decision that if you had the power of the Holy Spirit in you, if you've been baptized, that God wasn't showing you another way. You chose not to. And then it's on us. It's our choice. That's where repentance has to come in. And what he's saying is he lives us, so we should, we should know that we are believers, but we're not truly knowing we are believers if we don't have the power of God in us. It's the power of God that raised Jesus from the dead. He calls those things into existence that didn't exist before. And Paul says it's the power of God. It's that same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you and me. Do you believe that? The belief has to take place in order for you to transition into the power of the Holy Spirit in you because it's the power of the Holy Spirit. It has nothing to do with you because you cannot be obedient. You cannot be disciplined. And you cannot be humili and walk in humility. You can't do that. I can't do that in my flesh. It's only God in me that gives me the power to do that. And if we didn't do what we did today, if the Pentecost didn't happen today, that would have never happened. It changed the disciples. It can change you and me if you make the choice. Luke 6, 46 through 49. We'll cut some of this out. Chapter 6, verses 46 and 49, through to 49. This is Jesus speaking. But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? That's what I like about that. Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like. 
He is like a man building a house who dug a deep, dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against that house and could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. But he who heard, he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built a house on the earth without a foundation, against which the stream beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of the house was great. That's what we lack. Okay, and here's Jesus says in the beginning of this. There's no action taking place, okay? He's saying, look, you're calling me Lord, Lord. You're saying all those things. You believe. You say you believe. You're doing that. You're going to church. You're doing all those things. You believe. Everything's good. But you're not doing the things I say. You're not really doing the things I say. There is no action taking place. And if there's no action taking place, then you're only going to go so far. And if you're only banking on only going so far, what's going to happen when the storm comes? You're going to crack and you're going to fall away because the power of God is not evident in you. You're going to give way to whatever it is that's in front of you. Be it addiction, be it lust, be it money, whatever it is, whatever it is, it doesn't matter, it's all from the devil, right? So in any place, when that starts to take place, and you can't handle it, and you fall away, that's because, you know what? You don't have the power of the Holy Spirit in you to give you the strength to fight that off. This is Jesus saying this. But if you're focusing on Him... He's got it, right? You'll keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. Why? Because we trust in you. We trust in him. In those times of trouble, why? Because the power of God is in me. And I'm going to call upon that power of God to help me. Not my flesh, but God. Because I know I can't do it. So two things happen in that upper room. Two things happened in the upper room. They were in one accord. And that's the problem sometimes. We come in here and half the people's minds are on all other things, but coming in here for one purpose and one purpose only. And that's the second thing that they had going for them. They went up into that upper room expecting. Expecting something to happen. Believing and expecting something to happen. Do you get up every morning believing and expecting something's going to happen? You've already been defeated if you don't. When you step up in here for worship, in these services that we do, are you believing and expecting something to happen? I'm going to say no. Most of you don't. You don't come expecting. So how much... Holy Spirit's going to be evident if we're not expecting something. Where's our minds? Are they really truly transformed? Where's our hearts? Like the song says, take my life, Lord. Take my mind, transform it. Take my heart, change it. Take my will and get rid of it. Because that's your problem is your own will. And you blend that with God, and you know what? You're still in that belief stage. You're not in the power of God. Because you're not really in obedience. You're not really in discipline. And humility. And that's what God wants from us. Because that's what transforms the mind, the heart, and the will. Obedience is better than religion. Obedience is better than religion. Discipline? He disciplines those he loves. The Bible tells us he disciplines those he loves. So if you can't handle discipline, if you can't grow yourself to be disciplined in every part of your life, well then you know God's loving you, so he's going to keep working on it. Whether it's food, drugs, whatever it is. If we're not living a balanced, true life, giving him the glory in everything we say, eat, and do, 
Praise God. We still got things to work on. We all have things to work on. Every one of us has things to work on. But are we working on them? Or have we just laid back? Quenched the spirit and got back into the believing part. I'm just going to believe. I'm not going to move in the power of God. That dunamis power that produces an effect. And it starts with you inside and then works on its way outside. Because that's what it did with the disciples. They scattered, they believed, they got together. They were obedient, disciplined, humility, stayed waiting until the power of the Holy Spirit came upon them. When that happened, everything changed. Everything changed. Life was never the same. Everything changed for me. Life is never the same. Never will be the same until I'm up there with him. Because now I know the truth. And that truth will set you free. And it's more than just believing it. It's acting on it with the power of God. That happened in Pentecost. The third one is humility. And, and James 4.10 really quickly. Obedience, discipline, and Humility. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. And what? He will lift you up. You don't have to lift yourself up because then it's all about you. You have to walk around showing people that you know everything. That It's all about you. It's what you do and how you walk is when people are going to come to you to find out what's going on. Because you're truly being obedient, it shows in your discipline and in your humility. But if you're quacking like a duck, you are a duck. So continue to humble yourselves and learn. God's brought you here for a reason. There's a purpose for everything under heaven. And it's just for a season. It's for a time. It's not forever. But if you're not in this place with obedience and discipline and humility, you're not going to get anything out of it. It's the ones that are moving in that that shine, that come out of this thing shining. True warriors for Christ. Not in fear of anything because they have the power of God in them. Like the song says, whom shall I fear? Nobody. Why? Because you never let go if I'm focusing on you. In saying that, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter and the glory of kings to search out that matter. I know it's Mark's favorite verse, but the bottom line is, is that it's true. But God conceals matters not because he wants to hide them from you so you can't find them. He conceals the matter because you're a king and he wants you to search them out. And if you truly seek him, searching him out, he's going to give them to you. But he wants your heart in the right place. He wants your mind transformed. He wants your will gone. So when you start seeking it from that perspective, from your heart, he reveals these things to you. He's not hiding them. Because he wants to play hide and seek. There's a reason. He wants a relationship. And a true relationship, you have to come to him seeking him. And he's going to show you how much he loves you. He's going to show you how much he can carry you through. How? By the power of Holy Spirit that he's given us in us. So that we can continue to activate that power in us. So that, like, I think it's Matthew 10, 8 says, heal the, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely I receive, freely I give. Jesus said this, receive, give, receive, give, receive, give, receive, give. That's how he wants us to live. Not give, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. I'm going to hide it over here and hoard it. I'm not going to help nobody. I'm going to do this and I'm going to do anything. Oh, yeah, I got the power of God in me, but I'm not going to do anything. No, what is that? There's no humility, number one. There's no discipline. Maybe a certain level of obedience because you're not walking in sin, but you know you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. You're supposed to freely be giving because you've re re freely received. You've got to give it out in order to get more. That's the Holy Spirit is a living water. It flows. The Holy Spirit flows through you. You become, a, you become a lake. It's stagnant. It just stays there. Eventually it disappears. It evaporates because you're not flowing. You have to give it out. And if this isn't your ministry to do the things around here, go find your ministry and give it out. 
But if this is it, give. Not money, time. Do what you're supposed to do to be part of what we're doing here to help. This isn't about me. This is about total freedom in God and the power of the Holy Spirit. If He's with you, then give. I'm not hoarding this. Trust me. You want to do something? Praise God, do it. That's what I'm trying to do, teach you. But then when I sit around and there's nobody around, it's like, what's going on? Where is everybody? The heart grows weary. That wasn't me, that was God. Because that wasn't supposed to be in there, but it is. So praise God. Conviction, praise God. But who are we serving? Yourself? Or God? I try to serve God all day. Yesterday my daughter came for prayer. She comes two, three times a year to visit me. And I can't have complete peace with that. I had peace with God, but I couldn't have peace with what I saw. I was like, praise God. Praise God. The zeal is for more of him, but the zeal is to serve others. If you're not serving others and you only want to keep receiving, then you know what? It's going to dry up. It's going to dry up. We've got to give in order to receive. That's something I'm saying from the bottom of my heart from what I've been doing for 15 years, and God keeps blessing me. And trust me, it's not about the money. <laughs> I don't speak the, the, mess, the money message much. It's, it's time. Seasons. What are you doing it for? Who are you doing it for? Is the power of God in you? Is he speaking to you? Then do what he's telling you to do. 1 John 3.24 Now he who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. By this we know that he abides in us. By what? The spirit whom he has given us. I wouldn't know when I had that dream that God didn't exist, there was a true fear in my body, in my sleep, and it was still there when I woke up. This was God ordained. I woke up with that same fear I haven't had in years, and it was like, wow. Wow. I had to shake my head for a second and realize, Holy Spirit, come. And God says, this is what people feel like that don't have me. I said, well, I'll praise you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. But he let me see and feel that. And I was running around this dream to people that I, I knew that were believers. There's no God. What are you talking about? And I'm, I'm, I couldn't find anybody to, that believed. There was no God. And I finally started coming to me. You mean there really is no God? This life is useless? There's nothing about this? There's no God? And it was in me. And then when I woke up, Holy Spirit comforted me just like that. God just wanted me to know that this is what people feel like that don't have the power of God in them. They're always searching. And I know that was like that before. They're always searching, but they're not going to find what they need until they truly find Jesus and the power that he has for me and you. In John 14, 19 through 21, Like I said, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the glory of kings to search that matter out. If we seek him, he says, a little while longer and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live. You will live also. At that day, you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and what? Manifest myself to him. Manifest means to reveal, to show himself to us. So when we step into that realm of letting the dunamis power of the Holy Spirit dwell in us, Jesus manifests himself in us. Jesus said the comforter, He'll, the Holy, Holy Spirit will be the comforter, the helper, the teacher, the counselor. He'll be all these things to us when we call upon Him. But we have to call upon Him, and it's not just when we really need something. 
I don't call upon Victoria just when I really need something. Well, sometimes I do. But I don't call upon her when I really need something. It's a relationship. It's a relationship with God. We, he wants that relationship. And he says, when you do that, you're going to know my love. And I will manifest and I will reveal myself to you. And he does. He does. The Holy Spirit is the only way it's going to happen. Not because you believe. You profess with your mouth, but you have to believe in your heart, it says in Romans. It's a two-part issue. And Jesus said you must be baptized in water and the Holy Spirit, and in the Spirit. Does it mean you're not going to get to heaven because you believe and not have the baptism? No, you, you believe. Those who believe will go to heaven. But you're missing out on a lot here on earth. You're missing out on living truly peaceful with the power of God in you. And evidence is tongues, you know, praying in the Spirit. Praying in the Spirit. Laying hands on people. Pray for them. Watch healing take place. If it doesn't happen the first time, do it again. Do it again until your faith grows and you see it happen right in front of your eyes. There's no guarantees in, no guarantees in life in what we do. But what God wants us to do is to take an action and do it. Do it. Pray for people. Have a compassion for people that are lost, that don't know Jesus. Have a compassion for people, and I pray this way every day. Even those that say they believe and don't truly have the power of God, I pray for them that they get it. Because they're still living half in and half out. And who owns the fence? The devil. So there's going to be torment in and out of their lives. Jesus said he'll manifest himself to you and he truly will if you let him. You got to let him. So in the last scripture real quick, Acts chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, going back to that. Pentecost. So read it for yourselves afterwards. But what happens is when they get filled with the Holy Ghost, they come out laughing and smiling and stumbling over each other. And, and then it says here in 12 and 13, So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, Whatever could this mean? Others mocking said, They are full of new wine. They're drunk. There's a choice in each and every one of our lives. Some would believed and some didn't. And that's the same way it is today. Some believe and some don't. Some believe in praying in the Spirit, believe in people can be healed, believe in that devils can be cast out of somebody, and some don't. Where are you at? That's the question I got to ask you. Is he real for you? Are you living the experience? Is he real for you and are you living the experience? These are the questions they got to ask. Is the dunamis power on high living in you? That's what you got to ask yourself on this beautiful day of Pentecost. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Let's pray. Father, your words speak life. And your power is evident. Father... It's nothing that we do or say, Lord. And Lord, you knew my heart today and it's not going to take place. But Father God, right now I ask, I ask as we sit in this room all together that the Holy Spirit would come upon each and every person in this room. That a fresh infilling and a fresh anointing drop on us right now, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Fill us, Holy Spirit. Become evident in our life, Holy Spirit. Baptize us with your spirit, Lord Jesus the spirit that you promised us, that we would be witnesses, Father God. Give us your spirit, Lord, in power, in power. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.